Jose Ramirez is returning to baseball activities, competitive baseball activities, but not with the Cleveland Guardians. We'll get into it on today's episode of Locked On Guardians. You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Locked On Guardians. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com backslash Locked On today to get started. I want to thank you for making Locked On Guardians your first listen today and every day wherever you get podcasts. And before you have a heart attack, Jose is with the Guardians. <laughs> but uh, he's going to be playing for another team in a competitive setting. I don't consider spring training competitive. Maybe I'm wrong. But in a competitive setting first, uh, Justin, why don't you let him know, uh, where he's playing and then we get de- who he's playing for, I should say, and then we can debate <laughs> all aspects and sides as of this. Yeah. So tonight, uh, I think it was already pretty confirmed, but, uh, Jose Ramirez did say that he is going to play for the Dominican Republic in the world baseball classic, which starts on March 8th. Uh, I don't know if the Dominican Republic has a game on March 8th. Um, they do not, but anyway, that is not really uh, the whole point. But, yeah, it looks like, based on the roster composition, Jose Ramirez is, is probably going to play second base for the Dominican Republic. We'll see how the final iteration shakes out of that roster. But the preliminary rosters that have been out so far uh, also include more than one Cleveland Guardian uh, player on the Dominican Republic roster. We're going to get to that maybe today. Maybe we'll do it in a future episode. I'm not sure yet. But uh, today we'll focus on Jose Ramirez. Um yeah, he is going to play for the Dominican Republic. That lineup, by the way, let me, let me just read this lineup off if you haven't seen it, first of all, because this is silly and it's just going to be fun. Julio Rodriguez in center. This this is another projected lineup that has Jose Ramirez playing second, hitting second. Juan Soto, Vlad Guerrero, Rafael Devers, Manny Machado, Jeremy Pena, Gary Sanchez. So uh, this is, uh, they're missing a position, I think. They don't have a uh, yeah, center, left, right. They don't have a right fielder. Uh, that's interesting. So this line was not a right fielder. And so somebody wrote this uh, article and, and had an uh-oh. Uh, maybe they don't have a, a confirmed right fielder because they have a DH, but no um, <laughs> no right fielder. I mean, Oscar has, Hernandez could be it. Yeah, the bench. The bench, by the way, we'll, we'll, we can talk about this later. He, too, the yeah, I would say him over Eloy, but I would say Tay Oscar would be my bet. Yeah. So the lineup, though, has Jose playing second because Rafael Devers would DH and Manny Machado would play third. The lineup doesn't really have another second baseman unless they were to like shift somebody out of position. So Jose, I guess, would be out of position. But uh, yeah, I, I'm. It's going to be interesting for Cleveland with Jose Ramirez playing in the World Baseball Classic because obviously this team is extremely dependent on him making the engine go. Obviously, he influenced everybody last year, and everybody played off of his style which is what they needed, which is what they wanted when they re-signed him. He is their El Capitan, even though he is not wearing the captain's patch. That'd be cool, but that's not his style. Um, so obviously he is the straw that serves the drink for Cleveland. And I don't know. We know we know the history of the World Baseball Classic in terms of early competitive games, you know, where you'd normally just kind of be ramping up in camp. And um, there's also, you know, some risks in – playing second base that don't exist when you're playing third. So this is going to be interesting to navigate and, and keep an eye. I'm excited for Jose because I know this is a big honor for him. I'm excited to watch him play, and I'm excited to see the world see more of him. But um, this is, you know, it's tricky waters to navigate for sure. Uh, you know, on the other side of it, I will say this, that, you know, if you're considering moving guys around, Jose Ramirez hasn't played second base since 2018. At least Manny Machado played shortstop in 2019. Part of me wonders if there is a world like, I mean, Jeremy Pena is good, but it's like, could Machado play short for this? Could Jose go to third? Would that open up Kettle Marte at second? We don't you know, need to get into specifics, but I do wonder if there's a plan or a talk. I mean, for a guy coming back from an injury that he let sit since June, I mean, he, he dealt with torn ligaments for like all of those months to have the surgery and come back. Be like, now go play a position you... That she haven't played since 2018. Yeah, it's been a few years since he played second base. 
Uh, I don't know. There's just a lot. There is just a lot of injury versus second base, and for him to hold off um, his injury from the season is definitely a concern. And then and getting that figured out, and he was still kind of ramping up the last few. I don't know where he. I don't know where Jose. We don't know where Jose Ramirez is in terms of his uh, progression and coming back from his injury, but the fact that he obviously was was still rehabbing in December <clears throat> definitely a concern hopefully uh obviously the Guardians and, and Jose Ramirez would, would not be considering him playing in the World Baseball Classic if the thumb wasn't 100 percent so I don't think that's the issue uh, obviously I think they're both going to work together on that and he's not going to risk <clears throat> an injury either and the Guardians obviously would, would keep an eye on that so I'm not worried about the, I'm not worried about the thumb so much I'm more worried about Playing out of position, I say playing out of position, but there he are just is more, playing out of position. He is, but there are just there are just more risks playing second base than there are third base with slides and turning double plays. And you don't have a third base. Um, he is, obviously, he's familiar with the position. I don't think it's just you know he hasn't played in three or four years. Played second it's base, but twenty eighteen, so it's it's a good four years. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not worried about playing playing out of position so much as I am just the actual risks of second base. This yeah, is just, why Cleveland never moved him back to second base. I remember all, all, all this time they were talking about moving him from third back to second, like in 2019 and, and all those other times too. They could like for Nolan Jones, even before he got traded with the, you know, should they move Jose back to second to bring up Nolan Jones? There's a reason Cleveland resisted that, you know? Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and I think this is part of it. It's a higher risk. It's also like, different flexibility, like different things you have to work on kind of in terms of your body and, and, you know, it's different muscle groups in terms of your quick reaction and what you have to do. And I, I think, you know, there's, yeah, I, there's reasons why this is a much greater risk. And uh, the world baseball cr- classic always scares me. I'm not a fan just because I feel like there's like part of me in the back of my mind. That's like it ruined Cody Allen and Andrew Miller. Like I can't. Did know, Cody Allen ever pitch? You're thinking Pisano? Maybe it's, yeah, Pisano, not Alan Pisano, but it's like, you know, it's like every reliever who's gone out there has not come back to Cleveland quite the same. And Cleveland's going to probably have two relievers out there, uh, you know, and I mean, if you want to look at the positive, I mean, listen, it's, it's a great thing to represent your country. I just, I am risk adverse when it comes to prospects. So I'm risk adverse when it comes to the world baseball classic. Um, but the other side of it, I'll say, is if you want to look for even someone like me who's being curmudgeonly with it, the upside to this is that it's going to oper- open opportunities for a lot of young players to get a lot more reps in camp. And we recently got the non-roster invitee list. So, you know, it's not everyone from the 40 man will necessarily be in camp, but typically everyone. And then here there's a group of other players who are also getting an opportunity. And we're going to get to that on a second on Lockdown Guardian. So make sure you tune in to find out what we think, who the big surprise is. And the players you're going to have to need to know. But first, we got to talk about one of our fantastic sponsors, the good people over at FanDuel, one of our brand new sponsors. This year, the only app you need at your Super Bowl party is FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We're really excited about our new sports betting partner for Lockdown because they're the number one sports book in America, FanDuel. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They have so many great features to make betting on sports fun and easy. Download FanDuel now so you can bet Super Bowl 57 with a no-sweat first bet. You'll get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. FanDuel lets you bet on everything from the money line to point spreads to who will score a touchdown. The FanDuel Sports app is safe, secure, and easy to use. And best of all, you get paid your winnings instantly. So join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash locked on to claim your no-sweat first bet on Super Bowl 57. That's FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel.com, the official sports book of the NFL and Locked On. I was looking real quick at the FanDuel. <clears throat> they have the Guardians line at, at uh, over eight, eight, over under 86 and a half wins. I feel like I would probably take the over on that right now. It's uh, uh, minus 128 right now for um, over 86. I would take that. Sure. Yeah, I probably would as well, if I'm being honest. Yeah, it's a, you know, uh, I, last year I definitely told everyone to bet the over. Yeah, but, that worked out pretty good. Yep. We should, uh, you know, what I was going to throw at you is at this list of players that we discussed a little bit beforehand, what name grabbed you the most? 
I would say it's two names. It's uh, <clears throat> Dave, David Fry is interesting, uh, but probably <clears throat> I can't pick one. I guess if I had to pick one, it's Mike Capriz because I like Mike Capriz mm-hmm. a lot. I got a different but, one, so that's good. <clears throat> the other name I'd have to put in there, though, is is Kate Smith. I ha- I couldn't ignore that name either. Those are the two names I, if I had to pick, and then I would throw Fry third. But, you know, you need a lot of catchers in camp, so David Fry being there wasn't really a surprise, so... I would say Micah Breeze and, and Kate Smith were my two names that stuck out the most. No, I, you know, for me, it's Kate Smith. Um, the great story of the, you know, undrafted free agent and that, you know, one of those guys who got hosed by the six round 2020 draft. Like there's no other way around it. Got the minuscule bonus university of Hawaii guy. And he's just, you know, they put him in that relief role. He's missed just a ton of bats. Uh, yeah. command, you know, not necessarily what we see typical with guardians pitchers, but he doesn't get hit hard. He, you know, he doesn't get hit. So I'm kind of intrigued to see him in camp. Uh, I believe he would be, a, you know, I'd, it would take a lot of development to see him add to the 40 man, but I think he's one of those guys who'd have to be added at the end of the year, but yeah. of all the reliever types they could add, and there's a lot of players they could have considered, you know, you and I have talked about all the potential relievers. Smith, uh, to me, was the name that kind of stood out uh, for just uh, being you know, unexpected. I did not expect to see him there at all. And he, he's an interesting, definitely an interesting name on the rise. Yeah, the walk rate's definitely problematic for Smith. Uh, 13.5% walk rate at both levels last year over, uh, looks like, uh, about 70, just under 70 innings. So <clears throat> in the 60 range. So that's definitely problematic for him. The control is not good. The control hasn't been good since been a, been a pro, but uh, there's good life on the fastball. He gets good extension in his delivery, and the slider's good. Um, and when we, you know, we talked uh, to Dan Zimborski a month ago about Zips. Zips was very high on Kate Smith as a prospect. You know, has him striking out over 27 percent of batters uh, in their projections over 53 innings. And that, and that doesn't seem, you know, the ERA is at 4.42 according to Zips, which isn't great. But for a guy who's in Double A and has a lot of walk issues, that's a pretty good projection considering he's only got two pro years. And he's undrafted, so there's a lot of uh, intrigue there. Not like he throws that hard. I mean, I think he tops out about 94 or so. But uh, he's got two pitches. He's got good extension. He's got deception. So he's a t- he's a tough guy to face because he's what six five. I think he's pretty tall. So he's tough to face. I think he's one of those guys for sure that can edge his way into the bullpen picture, not this year, but somewhere in the future. I mean, they have other bullpen guys on, <clears throat> on the invite list. Bull, uh, to me, bullpen guys are never uh, a surprise. Like, you know, they invited Mikulacek, who didn't have a great year last year, but he had a great 2021. And if he had repeated his 2021 season in 2022, he would already be on the 40 and in, on the majors. Andrew Misiazic, I mean, good for him to get a, a look in camp because you and I both like him a little bit. And uh, he has, open the eyes of some in the prospect and the analytics community with his unique fastball and, and he's got decent command. Um, so good for him to get a look. I don't know. Micah Price to me though, is just so interesting because look ever on this list, like, okay, Logan Allen on this list. That's a, that's a no brainer, right? He's a top prospect. Um, you signed Caleb Berger to a minor league deal. So, you know, he was going to get an invite. Same with Michael Kelly and, and Roman Quinn and Caleb Simpson and, Maybury's Valora and Battenfield was here last year. You need arms. And we'll talk about at least Oviedo, but and David Fry, you need catchers. And they signed Tucson. But Mike Caprice is the only guy in this list <clears throat> who kind of like stands out is you don't need a lot of first baseman slash outfielders in camp. Like you don't need a ton of those dudes. You need catchers and relievers. And yes, you need backups. You need guys to finish out games, especially when you have split squad games. But like Mike Caprice was a guy who could be could have been out of the forty man roster. Obviously, they weren't worried about losing him in the Rule Five draft, but <clears throat> he's just an interesting name because he he flew under the radar last year. Almost had a twenty twenty season. He had what nine? I think nineteen home uh, nineteen homers and twenty steals. I have to go back and check, but I don't know. He, he's just not a name a lot of people know about. And for for them to invite a first base outfielder. Um, He's the only one, right? Like they don't have anybody else in that list, right? It's Quinn, Quinn and Quinn's the only outfielder on that list. They invited to yeah, non-roster. It's not. I mean, it's it's almost no bats, which is interesting because 
I mean, they they brought up the three catchers. It almost makes you wonder if David Fry will get some time at third base if Jose's out because they just don't have a ton of options. Like, I, part of me almost goes like, yeah, he's listed as a catcher, and I'm sure he'll get reps there. But part of me wonders if he'll be at third. I think you know to kind of go back, which you know people may not want, but. I think what's kind of interesting about Cade Smith is that they chose to go with him over, say, Mason Hickman, who was, you know, from that draft class, not, you know, to throw shade on anyone. But I think it is interesting who they choosing him when they do did have some other players. So just I think that speaks a lot to their valuation and their desire to see, uh, you know, he's, he struck out what high 30 percent of guys in the walks that like we talked about are an issue. But it's like if he's got stuff that misses, you know you can maybe work with him in certain way. I mean, let, they've got a, a blueprint with, with Karen Jock, right? Like that's missed a ton of bats, had a lot of issues with walks. Um, so, so maybe there's, you know, very different pitchers, but uh, you know, it is interesting. They're not inviting anybody here on a whim. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, you know, I prees, I just wonder if he is, you know, that other, I, I know he played first base last year, but like, I still think of him, I guess, as an outfielder. Like it feels like he played first base because they needed somebody there, oh, and not sure. like not not to throw it. Not like they just need to throw anybody. More like the, he was a priority guy who needed to get at bats, and they're trying to figure out a way to get everyone at bats. And he ended up with first base. So it's like he, I mean, he's a first baseman now because he he showed he could play it. Like he's outfielder first, and I just wonder. And again, to throw it back to segment one, you know, we're pretty sure that Jose is, you know, well, Jose's confirmed, you know, there's some other players that could be, it's going to be interesting to see how many guys are missing from this roster in the spring and how many spots they have to fill. And, you know, if they feel like they kind of need some more outfield depth um, because of, I'm, I'm sure they know like at least 90% sure the guardians, who's going to be in camp and who, who's going to be gone for two weeks. So, but yeah, he's a, uh, I don't know. When you look at our lists, he, he made both of our top 30 prospects, even though he was not protected or selected. He's got a chance to make an impact this year. And I think the Guardians show that that's the case by inviting him. Yeah, I, I mean, I was surprised for him to be on the invite list, to tell you the truth. I mean, th- I think that says that they are at least, you know, they were impressed with what he did last year. I agree. He's definitely not just a first baseman. He did play there because, look, Ak- Akron's options at first base last year were – I think him and like Marcos Gonzalez, who really only moved to first base because he could, he was he was hurt a lot and wasn't playing a lot of middle infield, and they had other priority middle infielders. Like they didn't have, they could have moved Joe Naranjo up to sec, up to first up to Akron, but he wasn't ready. You know, he didn't have the the greatest season in Lake County either, so they didn't have a lot of options. So you're right, and Preza is tall and looks like a first baseman, so. Uh, I, I was really not expecting him to be getting camp invites. That's why he stood out to me. And back to your point with Smith and Hickman too, both Smith and Hickman were AFL relievers last year. So for Hickman not to get an invite, not a, not a dig at him, obviously, but for out of the guys they did send to the AFL last year, Fry and Smith are the, the non-roster invites from that group. I, mean, I have to go back. Age Martinez is on the 40, so obviously he's there. Um, they were going to invite uh, Hunter Stanley, obviously. Yeah, I'm trying to think who else they They sent somebody else out there. I can't remember who, but um, yeah, I'm blanking on the AFL. But, it kind of goes in one ear and gets yeah. Down. But Hick- Hickman and Smith were the, were two. I'm sorry, Lenny Torres was on that on that roster yeah. too. But for that was you know for because he had missed a lot of the season for for personal reasons. But for Smith and Hickman as relievers, and for them to take Smith, um, I think says a lot. And, and I'll be interested with Fry too. We can talk about that in a second too about who is going to get more playing time with the uh, with jose being gone and with other guys essentially being gone too who to look for in, in camp who might uh who might who might we see more of especially at third base yeah no it's it's going to be interesting because i i think i think we'll need need those pitching i think they are going to be short a few guys and uh you always you know, do you always need pitching. yeah i mean yeah and you don't want to wear guys out and there'll be the split games and there'll be all that fun stuff uh, we're going to kind of keep hammering down on these non-roster invitees uh, on today's episode of Locked on Guardians. But first, I want to talk about one of my favorite sponsors. Those are the good people over at BuiltBar.com. I know them. I love them. And, you know, we've got the whole ad read here. But what I've always liked to do with Built Bar is actually go see what's on the website. 
Here's the main points with the Built Bar ad read. You can get them at Walmart, you can get them at Sam's Club, or you can go to BuiltBar.com, use the promo code LOCK15, save yourself 15%. Right now, they have free shipping on all orders through Valentine's Day, and they're pushing the chocolate. Browner, brownie batter, which is great, puff, as well as the double chocolate bar. They do chocolate very well. You can get a Valentine's Day box. There's also some limited releases, caramel apple, raspberry cheesecake, and then their classic variety boxes. Currently on sale, coconut, salted caramel, cookies and cream, uh, and a limited release. I like the banana cream as well. Go to BuiltBar.com today. Use the promo code LOCK15. So by the way, not only will you save 15%, you'll also get that free shipping. Remember, that's BuiltBar.com. It's the only protein bar I eat. BuiltBar.com, promo code LOCK15, or head to Sam's Club or Walmart to get your Built Bars today. Okay, uh, I pulled up the 40 man right before we went into break so we can look, you know, at, at who could be where. It is kind of funny to look at the 40 man and realize there's only two guys without faces on it on the MLB side of things. Um, but we were pretty sure, you know, we look at this outfield grouping. Richie Palacios is going to be at the World Baseball Classic, correct? Yeah, Team Netherlands. He, Team Netherlands. He announced that the other day, too. So that's like yeah. a guy in the 40. He will not be there. Uh, so when you look at the 40 man for that outfield, Benson, Brennan, Gonzalez, Quan, Straw, Valera, and now Prees. So we'll see if anyone else ends up not being with the Guardians. Roman uh, Quinn. <laughs> oh, Roman, he's, on, I, he's on the list. He's like, not I, not sorry, invited. I forgot about Roman Quinn already. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to leave it at that, uh, infield. So who can actually play third base? Uh, you know, it's like, if we're just going through who could potentially get some reps, are we pretty much thinking like Gabby Arias, Ty Freeman, the guys who played there this past year? Do we think Tana gets a few, you know, reps? Do we think it's David Fry who fills that hole for two weeks? All of I kind of lean. Okay. I kind of Martinez. Rokio. Yeah. They all will. They will all probably get reps at third base. I don't think it'll just be one. I, I would I would imagine that Arias probably That's what I was thinking. He'll probably be the guy that gets the, the at bats early in the game, you know, because mm -hmm. when you when you have your first games, and by the way, the first game is only uh let's see, from the time people are listening to this on February seventh, we are about I'm so bad at math. If you guys watch this the other day with the prospects, you know my math is terrible. It's February 25th. I don't. I'm not. I'm not doing the math. Okay, in my head. so 18 days. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Yeah, 18 days. That's why we keep uh, you around, Jeff. That's uh, you know the math is <laughs> is my strong suit. Uh, and hey, I think what do we get college baseball this weekend or is it D2 starts this weekend? And college, college baseball uh, is this weekend, right? Didn't NAI already start? You yeah, give love to NAIA I think. Baseball. Yeah, the NAIA I believe has already started. JUCO. Yeah, the JUCO. Uh, I, love I, the Juco. I think, you know, hey, isn't that what Lake Erie College is? You know, producer of they uh, are. Uh no. Oh, no. Lake Erie College might be might be NAIA, you're right. No, they moved into a division. I don't know. Don't I can't remember. They can be look bad. Uh, they can be, give me, sorry. They can be answer questions. I don't know the answer to it. They can be look bad. But uh college baseball, I think, is starting this weekend. I'm see how far behind I am. I, I don't know for sure, but it's you know, there's a lot of fun baseball, just to put that out there. But yeah, they're gonna they're They'll have some games, and they're going to probably in those have those split sp split squad games. There's going to be a lot of at bats. I do feel like the guy who will play early when they're facing the like, what is it? Is it Major League Two? Where I know people don't like that movie, but where they talk about Willie's really hitting for power this year, and <laughs> Lou Brown says, uh, "Yeah, off a guy who'll be back in groceries in a week." And that's <laughs> that. I mean, it's it's kind of a true point. Like late in the game, that's why like you almost need. Um, situational data for spring training because it really does come down to who these guys are facing and like those early at bats matter a lot more than the later at bats where it's kind of like you know you're you're running it out a bit you're getting a chance to see other guys there is value in it but I, I feel like I wouldn't be surprised if Gabby starts most games and then hands off to someone else. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah, I think that's what that's what he ends up doing. He'll get most of the reps there. And speaking of your, I, I want to throw this out to people who maybe not aren't aware of. You're talking about situational data baseball reference is your friend for spring training baseball reference has like the uh, equivalent formula of who they face they do a scale i think it's like i don't know if it's like two to ten whatever it is but they don't do any data for spring training <laughs> it's well it's no. not data it's just they track no. 
No, I know they're trying. The level but like, of competition you face. Yeah, like, I'm just saying it, it's better than nothing. We don't have anything else to go no, off. I, of, I would just, just say use nothing. I, I would say. Well, I no like that because at, at least <laughs> at least it tells you, like you know, if Gabby Harris is facing a seven and the seven is like a uh, equivalent of a triple A pitcher, that's better than a four of a guy who will be bagging groceries next week. You're absolutely right. So baseball reference does have that. So if you're not if you're not familiar with that, that's that's like the that's all we have to go off unless you're looking at individual box scores and looking at the the game lines, but uh, you're right. So I, I think, yeah, Arias gets the earliest bats and then Thank you for build just teaching Hiram a new stat to, to come and tweet at me during this pre This, uh, this pre would training. be a helpful stat. I'm sorry. I find this to be helpful. I mean, Let's it's better, but I, was, I, I still argue that like at the end of the day, it's like, a contextual stat. Yeah, it's, it's good. It's contextual. Con- Contextual I, is good. Is always your context is always your friend. I don't care yeah. if it's baseball, if it's any sport. Context is always your friend. Dating, marriage, kids, finances doesn't matter. Context is your friend, and it's your friend here. Even if it's not perfect, it's still your friend. No, and that's fair. It just I I would always caution anyone, even with good data, to not take spring training data with any more than a grain of salt. Results, um, results yeah. don't don't forget the well, results. Yeah. Uh, it's, there, there's a lot more to it. If, you know, someone has a bad spring tra- I mean, it was it like every pitcher kind of pooped the bed last year in spring training. Cause sometimes they're working on new pitches. Like they're not even throwing their best stuff. They're kind of working and trying to see what they can figure out. It's a, it's a time to work on stuff. So don't get, don't get too stressed. Don't get too psyched. Don't believe, you know, uh, was it Casey Koshman got LASIK surgery or that Logan Allen and Bobby Bradley are in the best shape of their careers. Cause this is where this starts. Okay. So uh, Johnny this is Peralta where, isn't going to turn into a gold glove shortstop is what you're telling me? Johnny Peralta got training. a raw deal in Cleveland because he was not a gold glove shortstop, but he was a very good shortstop, even if he was a below average defender. Do you remember um, his commercials for LASIK? Oh, no, I don't. <laughs> See, I'll have the to time, find them. They're out oh, there. No. Uh, a lot vision, of career, 2020. A lot of his career, I was not living in Cleveland. Uh, so for a long time there, it was just all Hegan and Hamilton. I would, I would get the radio feeds and it was kind of my baseball for the, the two thousands, uh, for about a decade. But yeah, I, uh, yeah, I mean, well, at the same time, it's like, you know, it, you know, I tease about Hiram, but it's like, it was thanks to him playing well in spring that I feel like, you know, the 40 home run chatter started with him and it's, oh, yeah. uh, you know, we have to always be very well reasoned with it. Some guys are going to look good and there's going to be someone who doesn't look good. Who's going to be fine. So it's the fun of getting to see baseball, getting to have these players back and a chance to get that exposure to players. Talk about phrasing and context exposure to players, uh, that we don't always, uh, maybe get to see or not as familiar with like a lot of people don't know Kate Smith at all. A lot of people don't mm-hmm. know Mike Capriz at all. And it's no an matter. Hour. Yeah. And no matter what happens to these guys, like you know, I always think back to um, Josh Martin, who was a player that got taken in the rule five by the Padres came back. I always thought he'd get to the big leagues. It didn't happen, but while it didn't happen, he kind of got to get there in spring training. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I had a family member, by the name of Bill Duff through marriage. And I doubt anyone on this podcast will remember, but he was like a, uh, a camp and uh, a uh, practice squad guy for the Browns. But, you know, it's like, that's where he got, he got there. He got more closer than anyone uh, can without actually playing in a regular season game. And there's value in that to these players. So I also want to say like for all of these guys, I think it's great. Like, I think it is also just take the moment back and like the magic of baseball that no matter what happens, these guys are going to get to spend a few weeks in camp facing major league talent being major leaguers even if it's not the official game i i think all of them can now say they're major league players after this point in time who is that what you would probably say for luis oviedo like at this point him being on the 40-man roster or on the 40-man roster on the, the big league camp invite the only reason he is still not a minor league free agent was because of um i forget there Trickery. was some it was yeah, yeah. There was some role i think it was andrew, andrew. Yeah, Andrew Fever Dog, I believe, sent me it as well. That, yeah. but it's like I, he's still got an interesting arm, and I think they still yeah. believe in it. And I think there's also that degree of like, hey, maybe this is the year. You know, they, uh, you know, I I talk about Eric Haas, where like Eric Haas was kind of at the end of it, and then it kind of clicked on, and now he's like a, a you know a full time starter. Like he's a solid. He's the Tigers' one above average bat a year ago. Uh, sometimes it just randomly clicks right, and things come together and the arm is good. Like 
And you keep running it out until he decides he's going to leave. Like, that's just what I think it is. And I think it's an impressive, you know, velocity and everything else. So it's, you know, it's a chance to get another look at that. What do you think about the role? I I was, uh, Zach Meisel said to confirm that they were going to uh, have Tuki Tucson in a multi-inning role. So he's not going to be a starter. He's not going to be a a strict reliever, but he's going to just, to, he's going to build up into a multi-inning role. I'm not sure really what to make of that. This is like a, a project they haven't really done in a while. I also wonder when Brian Shaw is going to show up to camp too. I, I guarantee you, I guarantee you, there is going to be like a the second week. Like the, we're going to hear on March 1st, like Brian Shaw is here in Goodyear and he might just be hanging out and visiting Tito, visiting the team, or he might be there taking a physical. Like, I don't know. I'm just waiting for – I'm waiting for the day that Zach or Andre or somebody tweets, Brian Shaw is here, and they're just like, oh, but he's just visiting. Like, Yeah, I mean, there's going to be one of those. But, I mean, there was all the conspiracy theories last year that he was going to get added back to the 40-man after he came off. So I'm looking forward to all of those popping up again. Oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah, he'll, he'll show up at some point. I mean, Tito needs, needs someone to play cribbage with. And it's not like anyone under, I mean, I know Brian Charles younger than me, but I, I don't know how to play cribbage. And that's, that's you're, nope. you're getting it. I would bet it's a 1% of baseball players. He is in the 99th percentile of something when it comes to uh, scores. It's, it's cribbage knowledge. They got to convince Tito to play chess since they're all playing chess. Yeah. Now. They got to get him playing chess. But yeah, no, are we, <laughs> you know, it, it's going to pop up with that with him. Uh, but yeah, no, it's going to be, yeah, Tito needs to learn chess. But I feel like Tito just kind of likes the probably the the talking aspect of cards. I feel like he would be someone yeah. who's probably always chattering, where chess is more of a silent game. I don't think uh, that would necessarily be his. There's no um, smack talking. I don't play chess, but I can't imagine there's not a lot of smack talking. I think you get that in cards. I, don't know. I always felt like I don't know my when I when I played <laughs> chess a lot. It's been a while. The smack talking was always like when you're. Uh, you know, you, you trap someone. It's it's more the act of the chess play when you're like, oh, I've got you forked, forked, F-O-R-K, where you can choose, you know, I'm going to get one of your, your pieces here safely. And it's it's always those maneuvers where, you know, the, you can see the other person swearing in their head uh, is the trash talking of chess. So I feel like, you know, I, if I faced Stephen Kwan, he'd utterly obliterate me. I'll just put that on record. I got no faith in my ability <laughs> against him. He wouldn't even have to talk trash. I think he, he would just let us play to the talking. Yeah. Uh, so we uh, <laughs> looking at this team, uh, looking at this non-roster. Uh, aren't we like contractually obligated to talk about catchers? We, we really haven't, but we spent most of the off season talking about. It. I feel like Other if you were to if you were to take a number of all the off season shows we did, and then looked at them individually, how many times we talked about catcher? I would bet the percentage of times we talked about catcher in a show or in the soft season was probably over 75%. So I, I don't really have anything to say about, I, I like Mabry's Valora's arm. He's been an interesting prospect. I think everybody thinks that Cam Gallagher probably gets that. Cause like you said before, he's the guy who's been on teams before and he can keep the seat warm for Bo Naylor and Valoria is uh, I don't know. Valoria is a left-hander though. So I don't know. We'll see. I'll be curious. I, I, Gallagher doesn't have a good history of throwing out runners. He's no. a better framer, but Valoria doesn't have a lot of experience, but he's got a cannon for an arm. I will be curious to see how they make these decisions in camp with who becomes the backup catcher. I mean, are we are we just like writing off Brian Lavastid at this point? Like, is he just has no chance to be the backup catcher? And I I I would say it would stunt his development if they did. And I don't know what I still think his ultimate ceiling. I know you agree is probably. A, a decent backup catcher, but I think he's got a chance spill. to, I don't know. I think he's got a, a cat. The floor at catcher is so low. It is that, like, it is. I think, I, I think there is a world where he's a second. He could be a second division starter. Yeah. You know, like I, I don't think Bat that's first. beyond the realm. No, I don't think he's like an elite tier, but like, could he, be, I mean, we just saw Roberto Perez get 2.5. I mean, it's a minor league contract, but if he makes the giants, they're agreeing to pay him 2.5 million. For a guy whose body I believe is eighty percent paper mache. Oh, Roberto he hasn't played he, a full season since I mean, twenty nineteen. He hasn't even played like fifty games. It feels like it's just he is. 
Yeah. You know, and one full season out of the whole kitten caboodle, I feel like it's been rough. And I, I mean, I really liked him. I mean, the right handed power, the walk rate, but I, he is, he got 2.5 million after, I mean, did he play more in a month last year? And then before that, it's, it's uh, a, a low a ceiling. Lot of just, got a great approach at the plate, too. Yeah. So. And if there's, you know, again, one thing we should learn from watching this catching position over the last two years is like, don't take one year of data. Don't throw, you know, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? That's the expression. It's like, don't overinvest in one year because I paid the, I did, right? That's why Bo Naylor was like 30th for me a year ago. Like, and I, a critical mistake. And the important thing when you're doing this evaluation game is to learn from those critical mistakes. I'm like, okay, I got to look at a whole big picture because the one, and I think the advantage Lavastita has over Naylor when you're comparing these prospects, their bad years is like, Lava Steed has had success at double in at double A. He's had success in the upper minors before, uh, whereas Naylor got to the upper minors and struggled and then rebounded. But I think, I don't know. I, I think, I, I don't think he's necessarily has a great chance to make it out of camp. He could, especially if they feel there's a 40 man crunch and they don't want to like cut someone like Palacios, but, um, you know, yeah, I, Valoria or Gallagher, if they are the backup catcher, I almost said quarterback. Jeez. Um, if they are the backup catcher, a lot of quarterbacks uh, are catchers, or a lot of catchers have been quarterbacks. So. Tom Brady. Um, yeah, I, they have to create a 40 man spot. And it's 40 man spots are difficult. We, we spent a lot of time talking about that, too. Um, and, and you could also probably blame a lot of Lava Steve's issues last year on the injury, at the hamstring mm-hmm. injury in AAA after, first of all, he was not ready to be in the major leagues no. in April last year. That, that was the consequence of a 40 man crunch. When Luke Maley went down, and it was no, they had they were like, we're not going to cut somebody off the forty just to get Sandy Leon out here for a month. We're just going to roll with Lavastida. Was he ready? Absolutely not. Right, and, but they uh, he, he was absolutely not ready for that. But they had no other choice, and, and that may happen again this year. That may, but I, I would say, like N- Naylor struggle, Naylor struggle. Like you said, don't don't over analyze one bad year because look, look if you look at Cleveland's draft specifically. How many times have we talked about Cleveland's drafting? They will overlook a bad junior year if you had a great mm-hmm. sophomore year. They've done that in the past. They care Same more thing about with the prospects. Tape. Right. That yeah, that too. So you you can blame Lavastina's bad bad season last year on A being rushed to the majors before he was ready because of an injury in a 40 man situation. And B, he was injured himself after he went back to AAA and he really just spent the rest of the year catching up. So yeah, you can throw a lot of that out with a grain of salt too. So I don't know if it's it would be good for him to be the backup catcher for his long term development, but I don't know. I, I like I the only guy in that list I like as a backup catcher to keep the seat warm for Naylor is Valoria because Valoria I think still has upside. He was a top hundred pro or not of his top hundred prospect, but he was a a well thought of prospect in, in some circles. And if he, he comes up and he was definitely in the top value, 10. you can trade him if if if. Uh, you bring up Naylor and Valoria does well. You're like, okay, well, he did well. We'll trade Valoria and bring up Naylor when Naylor's ready. I'm going to cut you off right here. We'll continue this discussion in a moment. We, uh, I, sorry, we're, you know, hitting that 40 minute mark. I don't want to get an email tomorrow. So uh, I want to thank everyone who's listening, rating and reviewing, downloading. It helps. Uh, you know, I, we have a new review four stars. I, you know, I, I would appreciate if you could give us five in the future, but Hey, you know, I will take it. So let me, uh, let me get. Does it come quick... with constructive criticism? That's my question. Uh, no, it was all positive, so there was no criticism oh. at all. Hmm. Uh, so it is from. Why, why is this not taking me to the reviews? We're at a four point six still on iTunes, so I do want to say, hey, still up. Uh, Joe twenty four L on February first, the most informative Guardian podcast I found. Jeff and Justin do a great job of breaking down the events, metrics, in a way people are able to understand. No, it is five stars. Never mind. I don't know why it oh. pops up on mine as a uh, four when I was looking at my phone, maybe he changed it, but uh, either way, thank you, Joe. Uh, anyone else who wants to do that, subscribe on the YouTube. Uh, we are a week away from being back full time. So there is that. Uh, we got a lot of fun content. Gentlemen done our minor league draft. Uh, we have not you know, handled a few other things. We're going to talk about either in the after show or maybe later this week that MLB the show is doing a partnership with the Negro leagues, kind of get into some of the great things between the guardians and like why they might be the most, pro- you know, guardian slash Indians have been the most progressive baseball team in baseball. I'm just going to say that here at the end of the show. Uh, thank you for listening and go, go guardians go. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I'm gonna stay by that progressive thing. I got even. I know everyone's like, "Yeah, we know about Larry Doby. You've talked about that before." I got more. I spent some time researching. We had to completely restart the podcast today because I spent so much time looking into Cleveland Indians history that I started by saying uh, Cleveland Indians instead of Cleveland Guardians, which I haven't done in months. Uh, but it's a really fun. I mean, for me who likes history, I, I pulled a lot of fun data out about trades and players and. Uh, Someone who was rumored to be able to go from uh, home plate to first base in three seconds. Jeez. Yeah, that, that was the rumor. I mean, it's impossible to, to tell, but we'll get to some of that stuff. But to go back to catchers, um, you know, I I understand uh, on paper, Mel Bay's, I'm not, uh, MB, MB, instead of me trying to butcher his name, good old MB, one of the two Kansas City catchers on this roster. Uh, I mean, he makes more sense on paper. He does. You know, he's the lefty. He's the better uh, catch and throw guy. He is younger. Um, but I just, again, this team has loved, loved, loved those, the, the, the crunchiest vets you can find. Let's go dig Sandy Leone off the, the trash heap. By the way, uh, Ian no, Hamilton please. signed with someone I saw over, over the weekend. So, you know, Yankees, <laughs> Yankees, yeah. that, uh, that trade. Uh, for Leon, uh, but yeah, it's they. You know, they have a certain type. They like those guys, and Tito loves his vets at catcher. You know, he's gotten uh, maybe a little bit of an unfair reputation from myself included about being vet heavy, but at catcher, that has been maybe the most veteran position rather consistently on this team. So I guess that's why a lot of us, myself, and I know Zach Meisel, um, have kind of predicted him there. But I will say, on paper, I agree with you. Uh, good old MV, uh, MVP, we'll call him. Uh, he makes more sense on paper. He does. I, I think there's there's upside there too. Because what are you, what are you gonna do with him in AAA? Like, let's say back up. I, I guess either of them. Truthfully, truthfully, okay. AAA catcher Naylor doesn't start the year in the majors, and I would imagine like they're gonna let Gal. One of those two guys is not gonna be here. One of those two guys is gonna go to another team. You're gonna let them out of their contract and sign somewhere else. Whoever between Gallagher and Valoria doesn't make the team. If there's a so, spot. Yeah, if there's a spot. Well, let's be honest. Someone always gets hurt. And also, the World Baseball Classic probably adds to that. But Good call. You could put Valoria in AAA because he doesn't have a lot of experience. And he's still relatively young. But the problem is, he's not going to get a lot of at-bats. Because are you going to shove... I don't know. Their catcher situation is so weird. I think a lot Are of people start the year in double A. I, I just to get at bats and reps. I, I don't think I they have guess, a chance. I guess. He doesn't really need to go back there. He's proven himself at that level. I, I know what you're saying. It's the same issue with the cat the pitching. Yeah. Gavin Williams and Tanner Bybee and and uh and even Daniel Spino and Joey Cantillo, even though they missed a lot of last season, yeah. don't really need to go to double A. But yeah, Especially I know. coming off injuries, they tend to have guys kind of repeat the last level of success. Yeah, so I mean, even if you do push Lavastida to triple to double A, you still have triple A. You still have okay, David Fry. You still have Bo Naylor, who's going to get you know ninety percent of the at bats. Then you have Valoria. I'm trying to think who else. I mean, I guess you're not. You're probably not going to keep both Gallagher and Valoria. One of those two probably makes the major league team if you can find room for them. If it's not yeah. Lavastida, so one of those guys stays in triple ma- majors. One goes triple A. So your double your catchers are David Fry. Valoria or Gallagher and, and Bo Naylor and then Lavastida double A, I suppose. But and if then you what, Lavastida with like Berglund, probably, right? That's her. Oh, I forgot about number. Berglund. Yeah, Berglund goes to, to Akron, too. I like And a then like bit. uh Am- Amadidas, who I mean they drafted him twice. You know, oh, if you're older, but he's gonna be a third catcher somewhere in either triple A or double A. When we did the catcher, we knew how bad it was. I it, Anything below, anything below Berglund right now, outside, yeah. outside of the guys from uh, the international like class and, ball. Yeah. and Logan Clark, it's it's so ugly. It's not even worth talking yeah, about. If they're so. unless they're if they're anyone who's not a teenager, you can pretty much skip. Right, that's essentially where we. Yeah, are. it's no, essentially yeah. It's a, and like tw- anybody from the anybody above the age of twenty is essentially. So to just clarify, people. we're saying the only thing that's interesting right now is teenage boys. I didn't say that. That's, so that's you, where the, you said where's the, that's a very general assignment right there. Uh, I couldn't. I'm sorry. It's uh, <laughs> I couldn't help with the terrible joke that's going to totally get us flagged. Oh um, man! But if this episode's not on YouTube. <laughs> you know why? But uh, no, it's just, just one of those things. Uh, yeah, it's bad. 
and they, you know, there's been a history of drafting catchers. Unfortunately, they've just not come together, uh, but they draft a lot of guys kind of like that. The Michael Amadidas, you know, I, I go back to Daniel Salters and Mike Rivera and a lot of those guys where it almost feels like they're hoping to catch lightning in a bottle again with, you know, our old friend, Roberto Perez that we talked about before where it's like, you know, this guy who was defensive first, but then got enough offensive game to be a big leaguer. And they've been trying to replicate that pro uh, success for like a decade um, without any success. Yeah. Hopefully that, well, they've invested more heavily in the international market. So that's probably why they're, they're going that route. Um, They have not had any success with college catchers and, Logan Clark is the lone high school catcher they have taken mm-hmm. as well. So, well, I well Bo Naylor I guess was a high school catcher, but yeah. he was really a third base when they moved him yeah. to catcher. And uh, Michael Barrett was a part time catcher when they drafted him. Who catcher first baseman? Michael wasn't it? Was it Bar- not Barrett? Uh, Mike isn't it? Oh, the ninth round pick. Why am I blinking on his name? Mike From Rivera. Pages. No, no the uh, the IMG Academy kid. He doesn't Ooh, play catcher anymore. That, um, I'll pull it up. Uh, what am I blanking? I'm, I want to say like MB, is it like 2019 class? Will, oh, Will, oh, when I've been close, Will Bartlett. Oh, Will Bartlett. Yeah, he he came in as a part time catcher, but he yeah. has he has not played catcher since he's been around. At least I sure. got the B right, and a W is just an M upside down. So yeah, close. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I don't know. I I think that I would like to see them give. Floria some reps, but you know, you're not gonna you're not gonna get a lot, I guess, out of him if he is playing twice a week and he doesn't have what does Floria have? He's got um he's got two hundred and seventy six career plate appearances over three seasons. So not really a lot of time to gain your footing offensively as a catcher. Um but his numbers in AAA the last couple of years, the minors have been really good offensively. Yeah. I don't know. That one year, in the, I, I, I got to see what Texas affiliate is because that could be. Well, same I, with Kansas City. It's PCL. So, yeah. Yeah. You but, could, But you could build some value. Like The walk rate is what you look at there. Yeah, the walk rate. I think he's also had some good exit velocity numbers, if I'm not mistaken. I have to look. Yeah. But, Just uh, yeah, max, max EV of 105, which is you know, okay. pretty good. Hasn't gotten in, in game, though, right? Like he's he's been kind of uh, a, and he's got yeah, it's been all over. I I just like I would like to see a little bit a little bit of him. Like you could create some value. You can either create some trade interest, or you have yourself a uh, an interesting good tandem if things pan out for him. But I, I just don't see how he gets enough playing time, whether it's in the majors or AAA, because you're not going to want to play him over Zanino if Zanino is healthy, and you sure as heck can't play him in AAA because the whole reason Bo Naylor is there because he needs that last little bit of seasoning before you call him up. So I don't know what they do with him. He's interesting. I like him over Cam Gallagher, as I've said, but uh, I don't know how they make it work with him. So that's probably, that's my long way of saying it probably will be Cam Gallagher as the backup catcher. Cause it just makes, he becomes more DFA able as it were, you know, he, he becomes the roster fodder, but they have to find yeah. roster fodder to add the roster fodder to the roster. I just said roster way too many times. And now it, I, I it doesn't feel, mean anything. I just feel like we're going to get, Listen, and I want to I'll go back to this. It's like I know people are like, like what they had to do with Nolan Jones. What they did with Nolan Jones is purely because they like Juan Brito. It was again not about Nolan Jones. An opportunity presented, they went and got a guy they wanted. But I do feel like we're going to get to the end of this camp, and we're going to see a situation where like a Palacios or someone kind of like those guys who are who aren't roster fodder, who have value but don't necessarily have a defined position in this organization, and might be you know, kind of passed over by other players like a Brennan, like Valera, just in terms of ability, we might see like some really minor deal again, closer to the Bradley Zimmer trade of a year ago. I I think at some point we're going to see that happen with this team likely to clear a spot for Cam Gallagher with the knowledge that you, I I think Cam, the reason Cam Gallagher is more likely to make this team is because he's the guy who's easy to release. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, if you call up Mel, Mel Melby's, and if you call up MVP, uh, he's going to, he, like you said, he's interesting. He walks. He's got a good arm. He has exit velocity. It's like, if you can just storm in AAA, great. You can storm in AAA and see what happens towards the end of the year. Call him up. And Cam Gallagher can be here for a month and a half, and you can cut him, and you don't worry at all. And I think that's why Gallagher makes the team, uh, because he's less valuable. As crazy as that is to say, I think he makes the team because he is less valuable. Well, he just fits, he fits a short-term need. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think he fits a short term. You're right. If you don't have to put Valora on on the uh, the forty man and expose him, I think. I mean, he's twenty six. Like he's you know super young. He'll be twenty seven uh, next. To, I'm sorry. He'll be twenty six next week. He's twenty five right now. He'll be twenty six next week. I wish you know, I was still twenty six. I shouldn't call that old, but. Um, yeah, I mean he's he's something that maybe maybe Valoria is more of a long term play than we think, even as being more interesting. But um, I think Kansas City is a developmental gonna... wasteland. I mean, position player wise, they've been better. I mean, they have some guys like Bobby Witts worked out, but they've also had a lot of guys. Not Prado, like... Vet, Pasquantino, and I mean recently, Michael but like, interesting. but it was like Prado was like was it like a Melendez? Yeah, but it's like a lot of those guys have been. Like Prado got turned around two years ago, right? Like there was. What's well, I'm that, saying? They, that's kind they of have before Mel. Out. That was kind of before Melvis. Like he was the guy who was there during the old, not as strong development. He was with Texas. Was he? Was it just last year? or Was it last two years? Who? Uh, Melvis. He was with Texas last year. So it was, was yeah. He? So oh, he was. Yeah. You're right. I didn't realize that. Wow. So yeah, he wasn't with Kansas. City. Like he was with Kansas City, and that's actually you can kind of see that there. And when you look at the data is like his big jump rate was that first year under that new um, farm system that was really showing improved growth. I don't know who was in charge, but like when a lot of those guys kind of turned it around. So he had one, one year with kind of that. And then that guy in charge would be uh, none other than Kent state grad and uh, Kent state alum, Drew Saylor. I should take Ohio. Mm. I have, I have to look up where he went to school again. I, we mentioned it briefly on here, but uh, the guy who is, uh, I, I see a lot of Royals writers and a lot of fans uh, who cover the minor league system uh, give Drew Saylor a lot of credit. He just got a promotion, too, uh, with the Royals. So I think a lot of people think Drew Saylor had something to do with it. Yeah, Kent State grad, I think he's, I want to say Springfield, but that can't be right. But Director uh, he, of hitting performance, according to his LinkedIn. Uh, yeah, he Medina, was. From Ohio. That's right. He was a, uh, a minor league hitting coach or coordinator last year. He did just get a promotion. I've seen a lot of people talk about him. That's a, that's a. I think I've said on the podcast before. I think he's a a future coaching star on the rise. So, but I, I've just seen a lot of credit thrown his way for helping out. You know, Prado and and Massey and Pasquantino and um, Wadsworth. Okay, where I, uh, you know, I was a suburban league kid. So yeah, he was a Wadsworth kid. Yeah, and he played for the Lake Erie Crushers for a hot minute too. Yeah. So local kid helping out. The wrong team. No, I'm just kidding. That's that's cool though. And I, but like I said, I've seen a lot of people throw credit his way for that for the hitting improvements. So um, position, so position player wise, the Royals have done better. But you're right, Mabry's yeah. Valora, his best minor league season, I would say, probably was last year in AAA and with Texas. But also, that's like what Round Rock and the PCL and all well, the Royals AAA is PCL too. So I don't know. Yeah, I think it's interesting that like he that last year in the Royals, he really kind of popped a little, and then. So, you know, it could also be a late bloomer. It happens. Uh, you know, maybe he could be our air cause to go back and like throw. Raise something. your hand if you thought we were going to have a full episode, a full segment on Maybreeze Valora this offseason. Um, you know, I guess Enio De Los Santos taught me because last year uh, I didn't, I I literally did a 30 second throwaway. I was like, here's Enio. This is what he is. This is their free agent signing, whatever. <laughs> and I rolled over it. I, comp- I mean, I'll be the first. I missed because I was sitting there. Like who cares? It's a minor league free agent. What what does this matter? And again, you you learn that they do very targeted signings of players for a reason, especially when they're earlier signings um, for that minor league contract. When they're going out of their way to get someone in like that first round or two of players available, it says something. To be fair, when you're a reliever, there's more avenues for you to play on the field than there is yeah. catcher. Especially when you're talking about backup catching, especially when you're talking about you signed a free agent and you also um, have a prospect you want to get into the majors soon, more than just some some late game at bat. So it's gonna be it's gonna be a tougher road for him. So that's why we both agree about Gallagher. But yeah, we spent a lot of time on on Mabry's Valoria today. So hopefully, whenever somebody asks about Mabry's Valoria, just say go to Lockdown Guardians on February seventh and. Yeah, that just check out. That, that carry that carries you through. <laughs> that, that'll get you all the way through. That, that'll have everything there. Uh, yeah, and then like I said, once we find out more, listen, we're pretty sure Class A, Morgan, and Palacios for sure are going to be. So as we find out, Palacios more players, for sure. 
for yeah once you find out more guys who are going to be and i'm 99 percent sure that morgan is is a confirmed as well um but as is dying free as i think dying free yeah so it's like we'll see who's not going you know that's going to change camp for two weeks massively as guys move all around so it's going to be we'll be kind of handling those as they get announced and like I said it's gosh the trucks have left like we're we're already they're there i think yeah you know they i believe they left friday so they should be there <laughs> something went terribly wrong right um so yeah it's gonna be it's right around the corner so uh sit back lock in on locked on guardians subscribe hit the bell all that jive they tell you to do share with the friend yeah you know the, the, it's the gift that keeps on giving because we're doing this at least three days a week very soon five days a week again as we are covering your cleveland guardians top to bottom future past uh present. all right here <laughs> present yeah you know right now the present is not as much because we don't have games but very soon it's going to be almost all present uh so buckle in and enjoy thank you for listening and go go guardians go